think uh, still, you got to refresh, I think. No, that there it just, goes. just a delay. All right. Um, welcome to the Gerber Kawasaki Friday early, almost afternoon uh, live stream. I'm here with uh, my partner today. He's going to be Ben Dunbar. Um, <laughs> Brett, Brett's taking the day off. We, we've we moved up seniority, uh, our newest partner. <laughs> so congratulations, Ben. Uh, one of the youngest uh, partners in GK history. Uh, if not the, the and uh, <clears throat> doing a phenomenal job uh, working with uh, a whole host of different people, but mostly uh, younger, uh, successful tech uh, business uh, millennials. Yeah. Um, just to get the disclaimer over with, we're going to be talking about stocks. Stocks all involve risk. Investing involves risk. Past performance is not indicative of future results. One should consult an investment advisor uh, before making any investment decisions. Of course, we don't know what your personal situation is. We will be trying to answer your questions, but anything we talk about may or may not be suitable for you. So it's so important that you make your own decisions, do your own research, or work with a Gerber Kawasaki or any fiduciary investment advisor. And lastly, we do own positions in many of the companies, if not all of the companies we're discussing. You must assume that we own these positions, so therefore there is some bias, obviously. Um, but we are also experts in those positions, and that's why we're talking about them today. So um, once again, investing involves risk. Please be smart. And that's really the purpose of our show today is to help investors such as you um, get better results and most importantly, um, prepare yourself uh, for your future and having a wonderful life and money is one of the keys to that I have to say um, whenever somebody says more money more problems I say you don't have money <laughs> okay because um, more money is not more problems more money is more easy um, but anyways let's talk about some of the issues we're, we're taking today so what, what I, we want to do is answer questions um, the premise of the show today we're going to talk a little bit about Tesla Tesla had some more good news coming out this week not only did we get through the environmental activists in the trees in berlin and berlin tree clearing has has begun of course i am not a fan of tree clearing by any means but tesla has said they will plant, plant excuse me three trees for every tree they cut down it's about the best you're going to do but they're building a uh, a wonderful uh factory outside of uh, Ber uh brandenburg and um, and so that's that's getting going again. So there was some risk of delay, which would push back the European launch by potentially a long time. So this is great for Germany, um, and it's great for Tesla. Second great piece of Tesla news is uh, Hot Wheels is coming out with the Cybertruck uh, by Christmas uh, yeah. for a Hot Wheel. So those of you like me who are desperate to get their hands <laughs> on a Cybertruck, well, we're going to we'll be able to start with a Hot Wheel. So we'll uh, very exciting Tesla news, yeah. um, as well as the Tesla china factory is up and producing cars um albeit probably at a slower pace it's much more difficult to work wearing protective materials that are required now in the chinese factories um but i'm, I'm still concerned about deliveries and what's going to happen with tesla sales in china this quarter which i assume are almost zero yeah so uh, let's get into some questions i i've been putting out a lot of tweets about coronavirus and its enormous e economic impact on the world economy and how that will ultimately uh spread through into the u.s economy which is like red hot right now um but with europe at basically not that hot and then you have um china you know not just cold i mean it's like zero so yeah. uh, i think they were saying the the auto sales in china were zero i mean you just got to expect terrible numbers out of china just for the next few months at a minimum I mean, well i think like the idea of a terrible number is let's say you're expecting 100 and you got 80 yeah but when you're expecting 100 and you get zero yeah terrible might be Understood. too nice right? yeah that's probably right. understanding um, it. <laughs> so we don't look at this as a terrible number we look at this not only as just horrendously bad, but like how long will it take to get people back to normal behavior? So it's not just like, oh, coronavirus is cured, everybody has a party and goes out and spends a lot of money. <laughs> not at all. Um, and boy, and, and, and I've been checking all around Asia uh, this week with people I know and, and talking to people, whether it's Korea, Japan, uh, I had a long talk about this with the people in Thailand. Um, people, people are just spending less money. You know, they're staying in more. Everybody's wearing masks. Uh, people don't want to be around tourist areas. The travel industry is going to be just decimated. I mean, this is just a horrendous thing for airlines and hotels. Um, 
So uh, we've been warning investors to take a more conservative stance over the next quarter. Um, as these numbers come out, they get put into the algorithms, uh, the algo traders start yeah. selling, right? And we get this sort of negative reinforcing cycle until we reach a bottom with coronavirus uh, economics, which is once we get Q1 numbers out, which will hopefully be the bottom, which won't probably be till April, May, right? Yeah. And then Q2, hopefully will be an improvement on those numbers, but still lower than expected. So we expect a whole host of earnings uh, downgrades for the S&P over the next uh, couple weeks and months. And when the market's trading at a higher valuation, I mean, it's clear people haven't priced it in. And so we got to ex expect a bit more volatility. Yeah. And, and, and you want to tell people how we how we look at valuation from the fact set report that we use on a weekly basis. Totally. Yeah. Shout out to the fact set people. We use you every week. We think you do wonderful research. And we use this fast <laughs> fact set S&P earnings report. And one of the things we look at is the difference between the earnings trend line and the actual valuation line. And that when that gets really extended, you know, we tend to take profits or yeah. get more defensive. Um, but especially when the earnings line is flattening out and then the growing line continues to grow, which, you have a larger and larger divergence between growth rates and PEs. Which is happening right now. Exactly. It's been happening just the past couple of months. We're not expecting earnings growth with all the coronavirus going on right now. And yet, with the exception of the past week, we've seen the market go up substantially higher. And so just how much you're paying for earnings is getting more and more expensive in the U.S. And yeah, and, and, and earnings that Aren't the expectation, <laughs> right, of 8% growth, I think is just like silly at this point. There's no uh, way. And we've had clients call in all week going, how is the market still going up? You know, how are we doing well? And I said, it's it's all about liquidity. So so China and the U.S. are just like flooding the markets with liquidity to keep, you know, money just basically getting printed and then put into stocks and bonds. Um, but it's not going to change demand. And I think that's the, the real issue is you, you can pump as much money into the system as you want, but it's not going to get people to go out and spend money in the malls in, let's say, Singapore right now. No way. Um, and this is a big problem. You know, you look at casino companies like Las Vegas Sands and the exposure they have all across Asia. I mean, tell me how they do well, you know, on yeah. uh, the movie business. You know, unfortunately, we own a lot of Disney and Apple. You know, I'm very concerned about these positions as well. Um, not longer term and not as a whole, but that China business is, is pretty much gone now. Um, so is that factored in on every stock? I don't think so. No I just way. don't think so. Let's get into some questions. Yeah. So any thoughts on delays or concerns of production downtime after backup supply chain goes dry? Yeah. I mean, for sure. That's, I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's not going to be a, we're done with this. We're not talking about this a month from now. It's, it's going to be substantially longer and we've had a huge disruption in supply chain around the world. Yeah. And I think the other way to look at it is. China has got the factories back online now for the most part. So they're very concerned about companies saying, we've had enough. Trade war, coronavirus, we're moving to Bangladesh. Yeah. But we're moving to Pakistan or wherever they're going to do what they're doing. And so China has pushed really hard to get the supply chain back up, even though they haven't addressed demand and, and consumer behavior yet. Yeah. So, so hopefully the supply chain, like in the supply chain in my house, my wife's supply chain <laughs> is back up now. Um, so supposedly they will start filling orders in the next week and shipping orders in the next week. But we are like this thin left and we've been telling people, no, we don't have supply. And so, you know, this is affecting companies small and large. Um, and so hopefully China will get stuff out the door and the virus doesn't get worse. So, and then a follow up question is like, will this cause a recession here in the U.S.? I don't think so. We, we just don't uh, think so. I, I, mean, I, I mean, the U.S. with low rates and, and boy, you look at Go to every mall. Go to every right. mall. Go Nobody's out. changed behavior here. Yeah. And that's a byproduct of most people don't read the news. So one of the greatest things about America today is most people don't actually read the news. You people who are paying attention to this on Twitter are by the far the vast minority of people in the United States. And, and we live in this sort of... Uh, feedback cycle even with the news that people look at yep. so if you look at your Twitter feed or, or or anything that you look at it gives you the news it thinks you want it doesn't give you a broad perspective of the world that you have to go outside the United States Let's there are see. wonderful newspapers outside Financial Times and Reuters and and and, and news you know all over the world BBC that give you a more I think 
uh, global view of what's happening right now. Um, but boy, in the U.S., things are booming. So that's the upside is that the U.S. has a wonderful underpinning for growth. The downside is if you're in the tourist business in L.A., that sucks. It's if you're in the problem. hotel business, it's tough. It, rates will be coming down on hotel rooms. Airline business, super bad. So will this trickle into the U.S. for sure and will create lost jobs? But I think it's already being offset by low rates. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And the Fed is just that much more committed to keeping rates low. And we have just saw the 30-year break into an all-time record low yep. yield. And I, we're seeing refinances now under 3%. <laughs> we have two people in our office who refi every five days. It seems like it's like crazy. Yeah. They, I think they got two – what did they say? Two point – I think for a ten-year arm, two and a half, two and a quarter. It, no, it was like two point six. I thought they oh, said. Oh yeah, two six. That's right. It was two right. six. I've heard thirty for ten years interest only. Yeah. On like a two million dollar balance, like that's insane. I've like, seen a thirty-year out of client get a thirty-year three percent lock in for thirty years. Well, 3%. I, that's what I want. I want a three. 33 percent 30 year um, walking yeah good. there exists I, they're out I, there I, i'm looking for a house now because of the rates you know it's just like super advantageous yep all right well it, investment talk just i, I got it five times so we'll, we're getting to you so craft heinz craft heinz what a piece of dookie <laughs> okay uh, let's talk about warren buffett's underperformance for the last decade the last year the last five years oh, goodness. I, I love warren I've read everything he's done i i, I uh, ascribe to many of his philosophies but warren is turning 90 and one must understand when one's abilities have diminished now he still is intelligent and whatever but you just saw it with the newspapers he uh, he bought all these newspapers and i was like why are you buying newspapers newspapers are dying yeah. well they're dead why are you buying Kraft Heinz? People don't go out and buy Velveeta cheese and are like, oh, yeah. that is not the trend. The trend is healthy foods. And it's it's taking care of your life. Coca-Cola, another one of their biggest investments. <laughs> You're not supporting good. them today. I, supporting I drink today. very little Coke. <laughs> I, I, I love it, but I drink very little Coke. Um, everybody wants healthy stuff. And, For sure. And, and so um, Kraft Heinz is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Their products are, are all unhealthy. They're all debt. mass produced, lots of debt. Yeah. Management came up with this, this 3G management, which runs it, came up with this great idea. If we cut costs so much, the easiest place to cut costs is always marketing. Mm -hmm. But there's sales that come with marketing. Gonna... And now they've realized, oh, well, we cut our costs, but we also cut our sales and our profits. Kraft Heinz, avoid i think i think that goes into how we think about companies right so you craft may be cheap right what's value people are thinking that this is a value stock right but if you're paying for earnings you want to be paying for growth if earnings are going down and you don't have a great growth story with them so it, true it's just like it's it's so, not attractive at all because so, where's craft five years from now right right like how much are they i mean what, are millennials are, like dying for velveeta uh, yeah i don't even know what that is right what is oh, it jeez <laughs> Is okay. it kind of cheap? You said it's cheese. It's a cheese. It's cheese. Yeah, like you guys, you have ketchup, right? You know what ketchup? Yeah, is? but we like okay. the organic stuff. Yeah, you now. guys get like you mash up. My, like my dad always said, "Don't panic, it's organic." That's like I've lived sugar my on life. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're from you're from the West Coast. Yeah, the but West. Um, but you know the other way to look at it, let's let's so there's all these value managers that are underperformed, and all us growth managers have kicked their butt for like my entire life. So why? Well, value to us is not what's cheap, okay? Um, value to us is what is something worth relative to what it's trading for. Yeah. And so a stock like Tesla is a perfect example. You, you know, is Tesla a value stock now? No, but it was a value <laughs> stock last year. And you could say, oh, how is it a value stock? Well, if, if you looked at the businesses they were in and the valuation it was being given, at one point it was only 1.1 times sales. That was and it was wild. just like, whoa and i kept saying this is just way yeah. crazy you know how do we play this as safe as possible when we got into the convertible deal i i got a lot of that and boy that was awesome but when you look at a company that's cheap like ford and gm like einhorn's biggest position is gm and i totally get if you look at the balance sheet and the cash flow you're like it's five times you know earnings, earnings and like <laughs> it's gm right seven times four earnings and you're like how does this go badly and i'm like well because they also have like 250 billion in debt and pension obligations and probably some of the worst vehicles ever gas yeah. guzzlers it's the same problem if i'm selling gas guzzlers in an era that everybody cares about climate 
and emissions. Yeah. It's just like it doesn't work. Totally. And and now Mary's like, oh, we'll we'll pivot into into electric cars, kinda, you know. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. Where's where where's that electric car we've been waiting for? for it's coming, reason? man. It's, it's, it's coming. coming. Yeah. Uh, another question. I, I could touch on this. So. Why are we pushing bonds, gold? Yeah. Why are we selling? Because they're going up. Because we look. push what goes up. Yeah. Look. Well, we have individual clients. We have clients with different goals, and you know we aren't a hundred percent only on stocks. We right. actually help people get to their goals, right. and so. When you make a lot in a stock, taking a little bit of profit, it's it's almost like a dividend. I know you like to say that, just taking a little bit of profit, and that's that's what we've done. I mean, totally. we just talked about the risk with the coronavirus, and although we don't think it's going to send us into a recession, but does that mean we may have a pullback in the market? I think it's it's right. very reasonable. And, to and, think and so. remember, as an investor, your job is not to just like hold on to something until it leads you off a cliff. Your right. job is to find what's going to go up in value. You know, somebody's like, oh, why do you like this stock? I was like, because it's going up. And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> the, the, the point is you want to buy low and sell high. And so when we see like the global economy coming to a complete halt, what does well? Yeah. Bonds do well. And so we have this balance in our portfolios at, at Gerber Kawasaki, and I think a lot of firms work this way, but but we really adhere to this balance. So maybe you're young, your balance is 80% stocks, 20% bonds, but the 20% in bonds doesn't mean you're gonna have one and a half percent treasuries. Yeah. It could mean like preferred uh, uh, stocks right corporate now. Bonds. We got 5% yields there, corporate bonds, five to seven percent um, muni bonds have taxable equivalent yields of eight percent if you're in a high tax bracket like ben um you know it, it it's gold like look at the rally in gold so if i own things that do really well when stocks don't then when days like today happen we lose half as much as exactly. the stock market so right now we're down maybe 50 basis points where the market's down over 100. And that's because of this waiting and then making these allocation shifts when we feel like the economy's slowing. Yeah, bonds are probably an easy way to make money. So another philosophy I have is risk-adjusted return in the sense of, uh, or, or now I call it stress-adjusted return, which is, you know, if I can invest in something that's really safe, that provides me income and earn a double-digit rate of return, that makes me twice as smart as somebody who's just like betting on luck and coffee doubling. And maybe they're right, but it's luck. They just don't, you're betting. And so like if I can, you know, it's that margin of safety, Warren, going back to Warren Buffett. And it allows us to be a buyer when things get hit. Absolutely. Right? Then like we just we move right back. There's right? companies we love that trade at ridiculous valuations that we don't own. There's companies, products, we love right. them, right? And we would love if they drop 50%, right? And then there's an, you know, we can take advantage and buy them because those type of companies, when the market gets whacked, those are the ones that are down two or three X what the market is. And so by having some of those positions, we're able to take advantage of, of pullbacks. And so got to look at valuations, even for companies That's you right. love. You can't, you can't ignore them. Well, lo love is a horrible thing in the stock market. Love can get you murdered. So you can't love a stock. It's a number on a computer screen, okay? Yeah. And, it, and it's just... If it's not doing well, you got to accept reality. But I think one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time understanding is like, oh, so you're market timing. And I'm like, no, we're not market timing because no. we're not getting out of the stock market completely or into something completely. We're just making shifts of risk. So if 80-20 is an aggressive or for a younger person's portfolio, 80% stocks, 20% bonds, and you know valuations are really high, and there's a horrible virus we've never seen before in history, wiping out one of the fastest growing areas in the world, maybe we put 10% over and we go to 70-30. Exactly. It's not like we're like timing the market. The, mar the stock market soars, fine. We're yeah. still doing great, you know? But if it doesn't, I've now protected myself on the downside. Exactly. And, and I think you know if you can make alpha on your stock side, um, to outperform the amount you have on the bond side, you can actually, what we try to do is make 100% of the returns of the stock market at 40% of the risk. That's what's really hard to do as an investor. Yeah, taking a little profits. I mean, it's it's really you win no matter what. Stock goes stock goes up, continue to go higher. You still own it. Yeah. Right. Things get whacked. You took a little profit. You have the ability to buy, buy more back. than you want. Right. And they go, and so well, you, how do you know when you're going to buy back? Yeah. And you say, well, when it gets cheaper. When it gets cheaper. I mean, right. look, it's not an absolute. I think people too often when they invest, it's yes or no. Right. Right. It's right. should I own it? Should I not own it? Well, it's a little bit. You know, you there's so many companies that you could have talked yourself out of owning forever. 
that have always oh, been Oh, I know. I, I right? mean, I almost did that with Apple going back to 2003. Totally. So when I bought a lot of Apple was in 2003. I think it was when the iPod Nano came out, and I was like, I'm, I'm really into music. And I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. Like, every song, it was like 100 songs you could put on, on, a, on a little stick. And, and Apple traded at a pretty high multiple at the time. And I remember I was like, you know what? Screw it. You know, I'll buy a thousand shares. It was like 30 at the time. Split adjusted. I think that's like two bucks now. Crazy. And, and I know, I know. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, and, and honestly, like we've wrote, I've written Apple for the last decade of my career or more. It's been one of the biggest drivers of alpha for me over the last decade. And most of the last five years, it's been undervalued yep. PE wise. Um, until just recently, um, and Warren Buffett, you know, made the play on it. He doubled his money on thirty-five billion, so he just still has his mojo here and there, right? <laughs> That's for uh, sure. Yeah, I think if he was a little more flexible with his ideology, he would do better. Um, but, but just the same, um, I think people do have smaller portfolios and might own like five shares of Tesla or something and that's all they own. Yeah. So it's like they think everything's an absolute like so I've got to sell my Tesla. It's no. like no. Sell, sell one. one. Exactly. And then you can buy, you know, some bond fund or something and you'll be okay. And then if Tesla drops to five hundred, you've got some capital to put back into the market, you know. Exactly. Um, because I think the other fallacy is thinking stocks just do this. I mean, that's yeah. all we've seen in the past nine well, years. Isn't that it how it works? <laughs> well, it's been a while. Like, it's been a while where it's like, oh, it feels like we make money every day. For sure. Longer sustained downturn. I mean, take even 2018. Yes, the market went down 19.8%, but we had a 30% year, right. year right after. So right. we didn't really feel the pain. There's no... Well, and before, too. Yeah. You know, so 20, 2017 was yeah. great. 2018 was doggy poo. And then, you know, 2019 is amazing, right? Yeah. And so we're at all-time highs on everything with all-time high valuations. Not all-time, but yeah. high for the last decade. And, yeah. and then you say to yourself, oh, what's the crime of being more conservative? There is none. There is there's none. Yeah. So people want to talk about some stocks that we own yeah. or stocks that we like. I don't know if there's anyone. Well, talk we don't about we don't give away our free secret sauce. Uh, we do work with anybody. We have no minimums. Um, GerberKawasaki.com. Also, if you'd like or subscribe to uh, our our Twitter feed and our YouTube, that's much appreciated. Um, but anybody can be a client of ours, and we'll tell you what we're actually buying. You know, if you're a client, because we do charge for these services. What I do talk about is what we own and why we like what we own. For example, video games. I, I mean, what does well when everybody has to stay inside? Yeah. Video games, right? Totally. So, like, in my mind, like, this is kind of a great time for video games on top of all the demographic things that are going on with video games, mm -hmm. on top of the fact that games are just incredible today, just yeah. the quality of the games. Um, but Activision and EA are two core holdings of ours. Tencent is a holding of ours. We own a little bit of NetEase. I own a little bit of Take-Two, which just pulled back. Um, which I like. Yeah. Um, Direct to consumer, better margins too, right? Remember when we used to buy the cartridges for the N64, <laughs> the discs for the PS1, the I PS2? thought you were going to say Atari, but you, you were born when Atari came out. Yeah, I don't even know if I was yet, but yeah, right? like the margins true. are so good because the games you go direct and you can't share games anymore, right? Like obviously that's not been the past few years, but just great margins well, for that business. Downloadable content has completely changed yeah. the business as well as mobility totally so call totally. of duty mobile is what is bringing activision totally back and you know i've been adding to my activision and my ea positions um well, there's another way that you can go to um is, is the nerd etf n-e-r-d uh, it's also esports mm -hmm. you know so i do think despite my displeasure that esports is going to be huge and and also gaming you know as in gambling uh, and gambling on gaming, That's what um, gambling on about sports. That. Yeah, you know we're looking at a lot of stuff in that right now. Yeah, how do you keep my generation engaged for an entire baseball? You got to be betting, man. You got to be betting. Your, That's your generation loves betting, right? It's, Crypto it's and all of it, all of it. Yeah. I was reading this Robin Hood stuff, and it's like, oh, we've got this new innovation. We can, you can look at your crypto next year, other stuff, and this and that. And I was like, boy, you know, Robin Hood's really fooled people into thinking, you know, <laughs> this is the way to get rich, but. But, you know, one great way to do it is just to buy a mutual fund and forget about it. Totally, totally. Does, this is a great question. So shout out to Joseph Lemma. Um, does, Joe. Jo, Joe. Does climate change affect your perspectives? Has climate, just, my perspective. Perspective is probably the wrong word. Our perspective. But yeah, our perspective, uh, our view. We have an entire theme that we're investing in on, on climate change. Uh, our, we, you know, we're a thematic firm. 
Um, and, and, and my premise is that in the next decade, climate change has to be addressed. It's not a choice. It's that or die. Young people aren't as dumb as older people who don't care, yeah. and they want change. I want change. I have children. I, I, I can't believe how much the weather has changed. It, you know, uh, Ben's a big surfer. I'm a big, you know, beach guy too. And, um, you know, we care about the environment because we interact with it yeah, constantly. I love Hawaii. It's my second home. It's in Hawaii. And I, I spent a lot of time there. And, 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 and the island of Kauai was just devastated, you know, the last couple of years from, yeah. from horrible hurricanes. I actually was through, you know, went through one of them, actually, my first hurricane. And fortunately, it missed us. And it was amazing watching trees being stripped of its branches from the wind. Yeah. Um, but boy, is it scary. And a lot of you all over the world have, have seen this from my friends in Australia who whose lives will probably never be what it used to be now with these horrible fires. My life has been affected every fire season for the last two years. I, I just, Five years, I feel yeah, like. You know, I just bought a whole bunch of emergency stuff, not for coronavirus, but for fires, you know, for sure. um, and extra food and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's just a reality that we face. No power in, in California. So going back to Tesla. So in California, they've mandated solar on the roofs. Um, you need batteries because the utilities will shut off your power every fire season now for two to three months. Yeah. So the battery business, you got to be in this battery business. Um, you got to be in the solar business. We have a large investment now in the ETF TAN. Um, I love the solar industry. It's very hard to determine which companies are going to really benefit the most, yeah. but I think they all will. For it's sure. A great so, way to play it. For the first time, I mean, solar wind energy, it's finally becoming viable and cheaper. It's, it's more profitable yeah, and to so, build a wind farm than a coal plant exactly. or a natural so, gas Exactly. So plant. that's like that's just been the past few years, yeah. right? That's been a huge change. And so, I mean, when we're so, thinking like so, 10, 20, 30 years, like 50 years, my kids, my grandkids even, right? We got to own companies well, you that are thinking about that. You know, let's yeah. work on that. We so anyways, that I know that we're 75% male on our Twitter feed, but, <laughs> but Ben is one of the... Uh, eligible young fellows at the Thanks office Ross. um <laughs> well you know tinder sucks you know we own stock in that too actually um <laughs> doesn't, IAC, doesn't because, suck that much, because i do no actually it doesn't suck I, I i don't know you just wish you Honestly, had it you just wish you had it when you're a kid that's all it is that's yes right. and no yes and no we had myspace for a little bit of time and that yeah. was kind of like even we dating. had that wow we're that close no, in age on, <laughs> i was I, I was probably 30 when i was using myspace but uh, but um uh, but i think that actually i think it's it's fine to just go meet people in human life and yeah. need an app sometimes um, yeah. but i do think uh where were we so with climate i think if you think about all the issues that are affecting climate you know i definitely don't want to be a property casualty insurer that's, that's a sure. bad business if i'm doing solar or batteries that's a great business right yeah. if i'm doing evs that's a great business so you got tesla like all over the place yeah. but then you have companies like next era energy which is a top holding at our firm it's been in a phenomenal stock that one of biggest renewable power companies in the it is the biggest amazing, renewable, story, but that, amazing company um you know it's a utility so it even goes up when the stock market goes down pays out high dividends relative to the market yeah. it's gone up a lot though but i but boy there's so much opportunity on the climate change trade over the next decade because we'll have no choice now the best part about this is not only do we have the ability to solve the problems of climate change with the technology we have today but we but it's economic it's to do economic. it that's right. what, that's what's the most exciting to now do it. Like right before yeah. right so if you're in texas for it, example independent of tax incentives right it's right. economic without even no tax it's, it's fine you, like you can put up a solar farm and make 20 percent returns totally. on your capital totally it's and, exciting. and and you look at a state like texas which has always been an oil state and and you know it's actually one of the best states for renewable energy because of the wind and the sun that's yeah, fine and now next era is going all through texas putting in these renewable plants and let me tell you when you look at your bills and you start saying hey i could pay the same amount for electricity but one is destroying the earth and the other is not yeah. it, it's kind of a no-brainer so yeah we're really big on this I, I, I highly recommend looking for opportunities in this area. Yeah. Um, and because, not, yeah, like, because we, we are socially choice. conscious. We are thinking about that. But we also think when you look 20, 30 years from now, that those are the companies that you want to own that are Absolutely. thinking about that. So Absolutely. we get the best of both worlds. You know, once right? again, here's the future. Here's the now. What we're thinking about is the future. Now, yeah. the mistake I used to make when I was young was I would think about the future and I would invest in a future that was really far away. Yeah. And then what happens is, 
it takes too long to get there you get a little before impatient you make money for the ride. and you might not make a lot of money for a while for sure. and that's not the way to do it. You have to look at the future and say, what are the things that are going to happen in the next year that are quantifiable yeah. in that future? Because that's where the profit is, yeah. um, not where it could be. You know, it's kind of the yeah. issue with uh, genetic companies like CRISPR and Editas. Sure. Love of, their technology, love those companies. Place. But you tell me when this stuff is actually going to work yeah. and be profitable. It could be years and years and years. So, yeah. so we don't own those stocks as much as I like them. Um, because I just can't tell you when anything meaningful will happen. For sure. For what sure. other questions? So, what do you think about Square? I know you you have uh, a, you have no. kind of a contrary view on Square. I, but I, I feel like compared to a lot. I like we use Square here at the office. So you know I like Square as a company, yep. and the service has been great. And I think it's 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 created a, a sort of revolution in small business in a lot of ways yeah. um, being able to compete whether it's the guy at the farmer's market or or the yoga instructor or whatever yeah. um but i also see anybody can do this you i mean and you got high margin business com yeah competitors i mean if apple just makes a dongle they could do the same thing with apple pay so easy it's just an app i know just be an app on totally your i yeah, mean I honestly think. like it would take apple five minutes to destroy For square sure. but they're integrating payroll and all that stuff and so i think they're they're starting to make the right decisions and becoming I, I, a bit more I vertically think integrated it, and lending is risky like what they're doing but yeah. i'll tell you what i think the ultimate risk is I think credit card fees of two and a half That's to three percent are outrageous. Sure. It's outrageous that there's a three percent tax on every transaction in America. It's like nuts. it's insane the inefficiency and the profits of Visa and Mastercard are enormous. And then you look at things like crypto and you look at things like Venmo. Venmo is kind of a revolution and it was one that I avoided for a long time because <laughs> in my heart I'm a PayPal guy. And but I started using Venmo well, they bought PayPal, because basically PayPal. I couldn't do commerce with anybody under my age, you yeah. know. And when I pull out cash, if you pull out like a hundred dollar bill in front of a millennial, you they're like, I have never seen this before, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, yeah, here's two, you know. And they're like, oh my god, you know. But Venmo's enormously efficient, and what does it cost to trade trade money? Zero. 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 So why, if I'm a business, and I've seen a lot of business people do this now, yeah. they're saying just Venmo, just me, Venmo directly me directly because it's like, why would I want to pay a credit card transaction? Totally. And, and it's like cash. When you start adding up, like you might spend forty or fifty thousand dollars in a year on your credit card, oh. and that three percent is twelve, thirteen hundred dollars, right? It shouldn't be that much. It, it, it's horrible for actually the retailers themselves who are suffering, right? For and sure. need every point of margin. So I think margin contraction is coming to that monopoly business of credit card transactions. Yeah. And I think technology has made it that way. And I think Square is just super vulnerable to all of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have any clients from Scotland? No, and I'd love to have a Scottish client. I'd love we're in, working right now to go global right now. So we because Schwab is one of our custodians, and we're working with a company I can't tell you yet, a, a, a Swedish a Swiss bank, and um, and we're going to be able to be all over the world. That is my goal. I with technology. So it's weird because the laws are are different in every country, but we're not going to actually put physical locations in any of these countries yeah. because. We want to do everything by video, and it kind of changes the securities laws, especially international securities laws, because like the EU wants you to have physical location and this and that. So considering the EU doesn't even know what it wants to be, um, so right now we're not sure how all this will work, um, but but I I'm hoping by Q2 we will be able to be global. Yeah. So it'll be awesome. We're getting there. Yeah, we we love the international markets. I love people from all around the world. I like this one. So talking SpaceX, yeah. it's, it's right right in our neighborhood. I actually right grew, up, grew up right down the street from them. Um, you know, they just announced a new capital raise. You think retail, they should allow retail investors to get in on this? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a reason, you know, somebody was asking me about this, you know, why can't we invest in these private companies? And I go, because they're super high risk. Super and, risk. And you have to understand risk. that, you know, with the stock market, you don't like something, you push a button, you're done. Totally. When, you're button, when you invest in a private company, essentially you're giving that company money and your time frame, like private equity is a 10 year time frame. Yep. And so like, if your time frame is less than 10 years, you know, 
that's probably a bad idea. And then most people don't have the money or liquidity to do that. To do that yeah. Hence the accredited I, investors. With clients, I mean, this is this is how I say this, how I treat it. Once you put money into a private placement, treat it as gone. Oh, it is. And gone. then, and then yeah. everything, if you get anything back from it, then you that's say, a It's bonus. actually kind of a miracle. Yeah, for sure. And you treat that as a yeah. bonus, but you never want to put a large portion of your assets. And that's unfortunately what, what people will be doing. And yeah, I mean, obviously Well, a lot of people think they've been like cut out from the good deals you know, because they see the, the private equities are not life. good deals. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're buying them you cheaper. You saw like five companies go berserk, <laughs> yeah. and you you didn't miss the three thousand that have gone bankrupt. Yeah. And and you know, I think you're really betting on people when you invest in a private company too. Like, are yeah. those people legit? Are they going to pay you off when they're successful? Like, it's just the risk is off the charts. So, yeah. but yeah, take you know. Lyft, take Slack, take Uber. I mean, you're buying. Granted, not the first round, but the later rounds, these stocks are trading at lower valuations right. than when those. What about Casper? In. Right? You know, oh, I got in private. Now oh, I'm down fifty percent. And yeah. then they like dilute the stock and all this kind of stuff. So, so you know, be happy. There's you know, what, several thousand companies you can research in the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, and, yeah. you know, that's not even the global markets, right? Yeah. So if that doesn't keep you busy on the weekends, it should. Yeah. What else? Got a couple more minutes, couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, I want to get some good stuff in here for you guys before the uh, my hunger takes over <laughs> and I must eat. Uh, what are our thoughts on short sellers and regulations for them? Oh, you know, this is an issue that's been discussed recently. There was some uh, group of professors that sent a letter to the SEC yeah, saying that. it's absolute bull crap that short sellers don't have to disclose their positions on the 13F like we do. Mm -hmm. So when you're long stocks like we are, you can actually look up our 13F. It shows every ETF and stock position we own, and it's three months behind, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we just did uh, Q4. Right. Yeah. So we just By the released. Time you look at it, it could be up to right, five it's, months it's, behind. Well, no, because it's forty-five days after you have to file, yeah, exactly. so it's forty-five days behind at best. Yeah. Um, so when you're short seller or and you sell short a company, you don't actually have to file a 13F because you don't, own, you don't own the, the company stock, and, and it's total and bull crap. So you have no idea what who's supposedly short and who's not, but yet you hear these things in the news and so yeah. on and so forth. I think it's a big mistake in the SEC regulations to allow this. Yeah. I it think needs it's to be manipulated. Disclosed. It needs to be disclosed. Well, I don't they're think also we... talking about the relationships need to be disclosed yeah, as which, well which... because we think this uh, this Spiegel guy is being paid by Einhorn yeah. to be the big vocal guy spewing FUD crap all yeah. day. And Einhorn obviously isn't going to do that himself. Yep. And and it's just to put out, he's got, I think he's got a whole group of FUD people that he's just paying. We have people at Tesla. I, I, I had conversations with people at Tesla that there was talk of pe people at Tesla that were clearly trying to get information that worked there from short sellers. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was for short sellers. Yeah, yeah, it was clear that that was happening. You know, but disclosure more than anything. I don't think we need to get rid of short sellers. I no, don't, it's, it, I don't have any problem with short yeah, sellers. Yeah, you have a right to short sell. Um, I think it should be disclosed just like just, everything else. Yeah. And, and, and I also think that the methods that many short sellers use are fraudulent right. and that – I to or or illegal. Yep. Um, I get the game they're playing and how to win that game. I totally get what they're doing. But when you take perfectly good companies and you try to malalign them just because your investment thesis is wrong, yep. that should be illegal. Yep. Like you know, it's it's fraudulent. A lot of the stuff you see about Tesla is just fraudulent, mm -hmm. um, and it's been proven to be fraudulent now as well. And you see it on all the major sh shows and channels, many of which I'm on, um, just a bunch of crap being spewed about companies that's completely incorrect oh. because a lot of the experts or investment people they have on aren't really fully vetted to the fact that they have conflicts of interest that they don't disclose. Yeah. So, no, oh, I'm, I'm, I run the biggest oil fund in America, but I'm going to go on a show to talk about Tesla. You know, it's like, what do you think it's he's like, going to what talk the, about? It, what does and, he know? And, and what's the expertise that I'm actually gaining from this person's perspective? Yeah. It's just a bias. And they, and they say a bunch of crap. And, and I've been getting tired of it on shows and, and just like hammering these people because it's like, it's like, give, give me somebody who really actually knows something about, about Tesla. Company, yeah. If you want to make negative arguments about Tesla, I can tell you what they are. Yeah. You know, I can tell you all the risks and all the things wrong that could happen. Yeah. You know, nobody asks me, though. Yeah, for sure. I think last one to, to wrap it up with, we got the elections coming up. Oh, God, please, no. Yeah, so oh. it impacts on the market. Oh. I'll, I'll let you tackle that one. <laughs> well, we know boy, a lot of that them. last Democratic debate. 
<laughs> you know, I kind of think they should just put it in a wrestling match and just have them go at it. You know, I'd love They're, to see them do that. I mean, it's the uh, back and forth between them and it is not helping any so, of their causes. Well, I disagree with that. I, I think that it was the best Democratic debate. It had the highest viewership. The, the, the fighting is what people want to see. That's what they want. And the bottom line is that's the best training for taking on Trump. That's true. So if you can't deal with the gauntlet of Amy Kohlberger and, you know, Buttigieg, you're not going to deal with evil Trump very yeah, well, right? So, true. So in my mind, just getting 20 million people to watch the debate is, like, it's great. Good. It's yeah. great news. So so look at, look at the, the elections this way. The market wants Trump because Trump doesn't give a crap about anything but money. Yeah. Money is only thing he cares about in the market going up. It's only thing he cares about. Yeah. So, you know, the stock market wants Trump. The stock market has no morals, though. So the yeah. stock market doesn't wake up in the morning and feel, like, feel you know, dirty on. because it's like our country is so bad. I mean, look at the genocide happening in Syria right now in Aleppo. It's a, a I'm sorry, it, it blew Providence. Right now, the Russians are just murdering, mass murdering about a million, basically women and children that have fled through Syria into this one province. Turkey's on the other side, and dumb Trump has pulled us back from the Kurdish side. So basically, we've, we're allowing a genocide. So the stock market doesn't care about no. those things. Um, it only cares about that. Then you've got Mike Bloomberg, who is the absolute best bet to beat Trump. Two billionaires. I guess both with issues at work with harassment. I don't, I don't know how bad Bloomberg was, but we know how bad Trump is. But two billionaires with their issues, um, who both uh, are from New York and 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 going at it with. I, I think this is the best outcome for America and f for beating Trump and for the stock market. Yeah. So if Bloomberg is the nominee, um, the stock market will be happy because totally. it's win win. Okay. But that's not what I think is going to happen at this point, Doesn't right? I think like Bernie's it. got it at this point, unless um, something drastic happens. Um, a lot of young people like Bernie. I, I think a lot of young people, um, for good reason, like Bernie, because I, I said it the other day, uh, uh, Hatem <laughs> quoted me, I was like, yeah, he's like your dad, he gives you free Netflix, and so what are you going to do? You know, like argue with your dad who dro drops you off at your girlfriend's house and says, here's my Netflix login. No, they love these guys. Yeah. Um, so Bernie and, and Warren, if they got together and ran together, I think they've got this thing. They the question is if they shot. can get, a, get along. So if we have, and, and a lot of people go, oh, it's not socialism. It's like some version of progressive Democrat. I go, listen, guys, all their ideas are horrible. It's, yeah. They're just horrible. They're not going to solve the problems they're trying to address. Yeah. Okay. They're going to create way more problems or more deadlock. And then we're going to get a Republican House and Senate yeah. if they're really doing well because investors and other people will be really concerned. So, you know, this election is still completely up for grabs. A lot of people think it's a foregone conclusion that Trump's going to win. And a, mean, it's a lot of the same people who thought Hillary was going to win. For sure. And so sure. I think that it's way That's too early to tell where this early. goes. As an investor, I, I think one should be concerned if Warren and Sanders win because they basically despise success and, and, and successful people and they don't really understand how successful people got there. You know, like we employ 30 people at our firm. Like I'm super proud that our minimum wage at our firm is very high. I, I spent a fortune on health insurance. But boy, if it weren't for me and my partner taking a lot of financial risk, personal risk, putting our families at risk, like people just don't understand what it's like to start a business and put all your own money totally. into it and like it, it like actually failure really wasn't an option yeah. and then i have all these people who rely on me now the wonderful thing the millennials don't know behind the scenes of running a business very well um and it's like boy you know there's a lot to this and it's sure. really hard, it's hard and stressful and i don't end at five and i might go home but i'm not ending anything it's day and night thing and so when you have a Mike Bloomberg who is super successful and becomes a billionaire, he was came from a poor family, whatever. This is what this is why you're in America, yeah. okay? Because immigrants come from all over the world, including my great great grandfather, to America from the worst pogroms of Ukraine and Romania, like just totally oppressed, poorest people. I have pictures, like the poor poorest people you can imagine. They came to America and and they came here for success. And, and my great-grandfather became successful from nothing, 
from nothing. And the, and the more we attack that vision of what makes America great is the more we empower and embolden people like Trump. And, sure. and, and so, boy, you know, I have to say the Bernie Sanders world is, a, is not a reality. And that's why supporting him is a mistake. Not because you might like some of the things he's saying or whatever. It's just not a reality that will ever come to fruition. For sure. And so, please, uh, Bloomberg, uh, that's who I'm supporting. Nobody's perfect. He's not perfect. I don't love him. But he's the best chance we have for having the best of all worlds. Yeah, definitely. And then just a quick little wrap-up. Sawyer Merritt was asking, favorite part of being a part of Gerber Kawasaki. And I, when I can speak for myself, it's, it's the people and the clients that we have. I mean, I had seven clients buy houses in the past four months. Wow, that's awesome. Seven, literally. And so just being a part of people's lives. We talk stocks. That's, that's fun. That's my background. That's Ross's background. But the fact that we actually get to help people and we actually make a material difference in people's lives, I mean, it's we have the best job in the world in my eyes. Well, and it's also, we don't have minimums at our firm. Exactly. You know, we do what we do to help people first and foremost, and we make a great living doing it, so don't think we're just, you know, Bernie Sanders types. But there's no question, my personal goal is how many people can we help? You know, I'd love to be able to help a million people. We're at 6,000 something families right now. Um, but that's what really is satisfying because it's not really about the stock market actually yeah. it's we were talking about this this morning you know my clients buying a house for his kid and what's the best way to finance it and do you think this is a good idea yeah. and and you know we do a lot of these talks with our clients and really try to help improve their lives and and that's what makes life full is actually being a part of other people's lives um, and that's why this job is I think fun totally. is being a part of people's lives but but from my perspective the best part of my company and our company is is working with people like Ben and our team. It's just amazing. Um, I, it inspires me every day to keep uh, going and, and pushing and, and doing well. Uh, we have uh, an amazing team of young advisors of every background and um, every stripe or whatever you, you want. Um, but we've created a really cool thing here. We'd love to get you involved with it. Um, if you have questions about your finances, you have questions about your future, that's what we're here for, GerberKawasaki.com. You can give us a call. We're happy to help. I can't stress to you enough. Don't try to do everything yourself in finance. It's, like, super hard. We're here to be on your team. Yeah. I think that's what people mean. We're not here to... Like do everything for you necessarily. We can. We have clients that want that, but more of having just someone on your team that can yeah, help. Yeah, right? that's and, that's what we're here. And for. having these guys on my team have helped me become a better, <laughs> better investor over over the last ten years here. And um, but I but I, I just think it's pretty lonely out there when you're only reading news and you're trading by yourself. Boy, that's a tough way to do it. It's great to have somebody to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Um, so that's what Gerber Kawasaki, Gerber Kawasaki is all about. Um, and that's going to be it for the show today. So thank you very much for tuning in again for uh, Stock Friday here at uh, Gerber Kawasaki. We've been doing these live streams. And we've been getting a lot of positive feedback from everybody from them. So so I just keep doing them. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to email us. We're happy to help. Uh, thank you, Ben. Yeah, uh, thanks ben for having me today. just done an awesome <laughs> job for his clients and here at the firm. Um, and that wraps up and have a great weekend and Friday and be grateful you live in America where you don't have to wear a mask all day, every day yep. because so far so good. So let's all say a prayer that it stays that way. Thanks.